Assalamu alaikum. Oh, <laughs> you're supposed to say it back. <laughs> it's how we say hello. <laughs> Wa alaikum assalam. Um, it's an honor to be here with you today opening the 2011 Sydney Writers' Festival. Though perhaps a more dubious privilege to be called upon to speak about nervous breakdowns. Um, which seem to be the natural order of the day, it's almost a universal condition. Who isn't having a nervous breakdown right about now? And it's, it's certainly not just Pakistan. Um, Libya, uh, the country has just become the West's fourth battleground after Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Muammar Gaddafi has just become a soldier again after some downtime buying shares in football teams and financial newspapers. <laughs> and the West is arming the rebels to the teeth uh, without particularly bothering to ask who in fact the rebels are. France, and can I just say that it, it seems fitting that the head of the IMF would turn out to be a rapist. Um, <laughs> uh, France, they've just taken a bigotry dynastic with Marine Le Pen replacing her father as the head of the French National Front. They've passed laws mandating what women can and cannot wear, which is very Saudi Arabia of them. And they have a president who takes counsel from Bernard Henri Lévy, which alone should qualify them for some kind of emeritus nervous breakdown award. Maybe it's the very concept of, of nation-states that induces nervous breakdowns. And we know that nation-states at the moment are facing attacks on multiple fronts, from multinationals which seek to replace the power of the state, from fluid immigration and how it is that we begin to think of our citizens and what makes them citizens, and from hyper-increased connectivity, which means, God help us, that Facebook has a population 20 times the size of Australia. But this is about Pakistan, um, at least that's what people keep telling me, a country that is perpetually on the verge of nervously breaking down. It is the world's sixth most populous country, the world's fifth largest nuclear state, and has, depending on who you ask, the seventh or the fifth largest army in the world. Barack Obama has publicly called us a cancer. Um, Madeleine Albright is slightly more polite to her, we're just an international migraine. And Hillary Clinton, who knows something about the subject, frequently begins most of her thoughts on Pakistan with, it's not an easy relationship, but. Um, and Salman Rushdie at the moment is very cross and wants us declared, all 180 million of us, a terrorist state, for something that really most of us at least didn't know. I know what perhaps you want me to say, um, or what you think I'm going to say, which is that our nervous breakdown has something to do with Islam, or that it's somehow because of or connected to Islam. But it's not. It's about a, a fundamental lack of justice, an absence of transparency, and overwhelming violence conducted and condoned by the state. According to the Pew Research Center, the percentage of Pakistanis satisfied with their country has fallen impressively over the years. 39% in 2007, 25% the year after, and 9% in 2010. You get the picture. Um, St. Augustine said that in the absence of justice, what is sovereignty but organized robbery? And perhaps nowhere is this more true than in Pakistan today. Three years ago, the current government, led by President Asif Zardari, passed a law odiously called the National Reconciliation Ordinance, which erased 20 years worth of corruption charges against politicians, bankers, and bureaucrats, and included the very large print that would make it virtually impossible to file future charges of graft or any misconduct against sitting parliamentarians. <coughs> Some months after this law was passed, I was visiting a former justice, Nasser Aslam Zahid, who uh, was the chief justice of the Sindh High Courts and now runs the women's and juvenile jails in Karachi. And he told me um, of a recent case they'd had of two young boys, age 11 and 12, who'd recently been brought in to the prison for stealing the metal bolt off a gate um, 
and they stole this bolt off the gate in front of the man whose gate it was, uh, in the hopes that they could sell it for something like 100 rupees, 120 rupees, which is negligible. I mean, it's maybe an Australian dollar, if that. And he asked them, he said, well, why would you do that? Why, you know, why would you take the risk for such little, you know, little gain? Why would you do that? And they said, well, you know, we heard of this law that says that thieves don't have to actually spend any time in jail. And he told them, he said, well, you're going to have to steal a lot more before that applies to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably not a coincidence that this law was passed under the stewardship of a president who, under his wife's first term, was known as Mr. 10 percent and during her second term was known as Mr. 50 percent and now during his own government has been rechristened um, as Mr. 110 percent. The last time this government was in power, Transparency International listed Pakistan as the world's second most corrupt country. Nigeria was the first and the joke was that we had paid them off to take the fall. <laughs> You, you laugh, but you never know. Uh, corruption, corruption means something in Pakistan, and what it means is this. It means that we are a nuclear armed state that missed our millennium goals to eradicate polio. And we didn't miss those goals because we don't have doctors or because we don't have the medical know-how. We missed those goals because we couldn't, we didn't have the electricity to run the refrigerators. So it's a nuclear armed state that can't work fridges. Um, keep in mind also that this is a country that has weaseled some $20 billion um, in American aid money over the last decade. Um, and this is a country that is supposed to be a rich country. We have oil reserves, uh, around 300 odd million barrels of oil. We have billions of cubic feet worth of gas reserves. We have the fifth largest copper mines in the world. We have coal, we have emeralds, we have diamonds, and we technically grow the food um, that we need to feed our people. And yet, we continue to beg for aid. And so the causes of our nervous breakdown are connected. The rulers are corrupt, the price of basic food stuff skyrockets, um, as feudal landlords and industrialists who are our presidents and our prime ministers and our ministers of state hoard basic food stuffs like sugar and wheat, which is now sold above international prices in Pakistan. And there is a national bloodletting. Uh, this is a country consumed by violence, as it were. And in the last nine months, the bodies, the hundreds of bodies of Baloch activists um, who had been disappeared in the thousands, a sinister byproduct of our country's engagement in the war on terror, have been turning up on the outskirts of the province, in ditches, bearing marks of extreme torture and force. There is, and this is I think the crux of it, a fundamental lack of justice in Pakistan. And nowhere, or maybe recently this has been more, most obvious in the case of Mukhtar Mai and the Supreme Court's ruling in her case. I'm sure most of you know um, who Mai is, but I'll, I'll tell you very briefly. In 2002, Mukhtar Mai, who was an illiterate woman from the southern Punjabi village of Mirawala, was gang-raped on the order of a tribal jirga. And she was gang-raped as punishment uh, for her brother's impudence. Shakur, her 12-year-old brother, had been found to have been flirting with a girl from another tribe. And for this, his sister, for this egregious crime really, his sister, was not only gang raped, but she was paraded around the town as a warning. And Shakur, 12 year old Shakur himself, was sodomized. Nobody came to Mai's defense. Nobody stood up to protect her as this was happening. Nobody said a word until six days later, the Imam of the local mosque, a man called Molana Abdul Razak, spoke to his congregation about what had happened and had urged his flock to go to the authorities and report what had happened. He said that those who had harmed Mai had committed the most, the most heinous sin against Islam and that it was their duty to protect her. It was also this, this mosque official, this religious man, who was the first to approach a journalist about Mai's case and that journalist would be the first to tell the world about what had happened to her. And some two days after he spoke to his mosque, charges were filed against 14 men. That was the easy part. 
For the next nine years, Mukhtar Mai's case bounced around from courts to courts in Pakistan. It went from the Lahore High Court to the Federal Sharia Court and landed up in the Supreme Court, which only just weeks ago acquitted and released all of the men involved in her gang rape. The presiding judge of the Supreme Court, um, Justice Saqib Nasser, wondered out loud on two occasions during the proceedings whether Mai had gone through all the trouble of filing criminal charges against her rapists simply because she was annoyed that none of them had proposed to her afterwards. This failing of justice is a large part of what constitutes our nervous breakdowns in Pakistan. And the question is perhaps, then, what do we do about it? And the solutions to problem states are never found in, in 30 second answers, in those answers that start with only democracy or only freedom of speech. Pakistan is a young country, it's only 64 years old and nation building takes time. It's about sustained incremental changes, changes that are carried forward by ordinary people, by ordinary men and women, not by marshals and not by generals. But the problem with developing countries, and certainly with Pakistan at the moment, is that every pundit out there has a 500-word answer for what we should do. And the New York Times alone prints at least two of these a day. Um, and it's perhaps the reason why Thomas Friedman is so gainfully employed after all these years. <laughs> um, the cue for cancer, since we're talking about cancer, um, isn't one thing. It's hundreds of things, hundreds of little things, and decades of work. And there are other failings, certainly, that coincide with Pakistan's. And a discussion on nervous breakdowns would be incomplete uh, without a look at the dysfunctional relationship between Pakistan and its best friend slash enemy, the United States of America, whose current nervous breakdown is almost as hysterical as our own. It's probably not surprising that in this era of themed wars, war on terror, war of terror, war on drugs, that new wars come tailor-made with ready-made outrage. But the insidious expansion of old wars doesn't seem to. So before Barack Obama begins a drone war against Pakistan, he doesn't need to go to Congress and he doesn't need to meet the press. He simply just doesn't. And for our part, we've lost the codes to properly articulate our outrage. A 2010 United Nations report on targeted killings found that America was the most prolific user of targeted killings as a weapon of war. And frighteningly found that in the eight years of the Bush White House, unmanned predator drones were used, largely it must be said against Pakistan, a total of 45 times. In the first year of President Obama's White House alone, in 2009, drones were used 53 times. In fact, he used the option to, to drone Pakistan 72 hours after entering the White House. The Brookings Institute um, published a report quite soon after, which was charmingly titled, Do Targeted Killings Work? In which they found that for every purported militant killed by a drone strike, 10 or so civilians also died. 10 or so. I mean, this is the algebra of surgical wars and of targeted killings, or so. Last year, there were 118 drone strikes against Pakistan. And if everyone, will, and it begs the question really, if everyone was so clever and everyone knew Osama bin Laden's not so secret location nine months ago, since about August, how does it explain the ferocious campaign that took place last year? after Pakistan had suffered its most devastating natural disaster ever, uh, between September and December of 2010. In 102 days, America launched 52 drone strikes against Pakistan. And it should be also said that none of those drone strikes targeted Abbottabad or any of its environs. They killed hundreds of people, none of whom happened to be Osama bin Laden or any of his dastardly lieutenants, like Mullah Omar or Ayman al-Zawahiri. But yet the defense budget, the American defense budget for 2011 has asked for a 75% increase in funds to further enhance drone operations against Pakistan. And so it was three weeks ago that in a sleepy garrison town of Abshabad, Osama bin Laden was killed with two bullets 
fired by Navy SEALs from the Joint Special Operations Command, an outfit that is described lovingly as sort of being like Murder Incorporated. A choice that was made, we're told, um, in opposition to drone strikes. President Obama vetoed drone strikes or a bombing raid to kill Osama because he worried about the, the risk that innocents may die, which is a bit rich considering that we know according to the American Civil Liberties Union that the United States military does not in fact track civilian deaths by drone strikes. <coughs> Departing from the Tarbela Ghazi Air Base, American helicopters traveled to Abbottabad, 30 kilometers or so, or 30 miles, sorry, from the capital, and within 40 minutes of landing, had not only killed Osama bin Laden, but had killed or captured another 22 or so people. Much has been made of the fact that eight days before this operation, the chief of the Pakistani army, General Kayani, inauspiciously told a bunch of cadets in exactly the same town that the Pakistani army was fully aware of all the internal and external threats to the country. But that's the army. Now we're almost three weeks away from the killing and no one has yet heard a peep from Pakistan's president. Uh, president Zardari met the news that the world's most wanted man was killed two hours away from his capital with an almost catatonic silence. And instead of a televised address or some sort of press release to the nation, he did what all hapless leaders do when in trouble. Uh, he wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. <laughs> and in, in this op-ed, in the 500 words of his op-ed, he claimed very feverishly that his government had no idea about the operation. And he waxed lyrical about his personal travails, applauded Secretary of State Clinton, an old personal friend of his, and seconded uh, President Obama's morally ambiguous speech, all the while resurrecting nothing short of a stunt speech of his own, which essentially said, please don't remove my government. We are very democratic indeed, even though he himself was never elected to office. Leon Panetta, the head of the CIA, has said that the Pakistani government was either knowledgeable or incompetent in regards to Osama bin Laden living in their country without realizing that there is a way for them to be both. It takes a certain aplomb to, to insist that you did not know public enemy number one was living in your country and in a leafy suburb of your country, not in a South Waziristani cave. Um, it takes more aplomb to, to insist that you didn't realize that American helicopters had entered your airspace, uh, that you didn't realize that they may have actually left from one of your air bases, um, and that <laughs> Your, your closest international allies have been planning to take out said public enemy number one in your country for the last nine months. But the Pakistani establishment's modus operandi of recent years has been to look the other way but to keep their purses at the open. And this is certainly not unique to Zardari. When asked on uh, local television, uh, the former president, dictator general Pervez Musharraf, said that when he was president and he was asked whether Osama might or might not be living in his country, he always went with the safe answer, I don't know. This has become something of a national refrain, I don't know, but please may we have some more. And it's this sort of clarity and cooperation that has earned Pakistan something like $1 billion in military aid a year since 2001. But it's not just Pakistan, it's with the same charmless shrugs of shoulders that we are told, or we were told, that it was just 90 days after 9-11, the attacks that made him famous, um, that Osama bin Laden escaped American surveillance and disappeared from the Tora Bora Mountains into thin Pakistani air. Seven years later, in 2008, 100 American troops were sent to Abbottabad to train Pakistan's frontier corps in deadly Osama hunting techniques. Um, exercises they carried out, um, probably footsteps within their um, feverishly imagined target, but, but nothing. Later on that year again, in 2008, according to WikiLeaks, who will no doubt tell us what really happened in a couple of months, um, another hundred American troops visited Abbottabad again to train the Pakistani military in Al-Qaeda killing techniques another collaborative visit that nobody told us Pakistanis about, and happened to miss Osama once more. Now, whose fault was that? Um, the 2008 New York Times reporting on that failure um, is, is, is more forgiving than of late. 
It simply didn't take. That's what they said. When American troops make intelligence failures, it simply doesn't take. But when Pakistanis do it, well. Now, what did Pakistan know? Uh, you'd be pleased to know that uh, every airport I've been to has asked me this question. <laughs> every festival uh, and every person who finds out I'm Pakistani. And I think there are serious questions here. We know for a fact that whenever neighborhood children lost cricket balls over the Bin Laden compound, they would never get them back. <laughs> when we played cricket in the field near the house, if the ball flew over their wall and we went to the gate to ask for it, the guards would be angry, said Tariq Khan, 14 years old. This suspiciously informed schoolboy continued. They would give us up to 100 rupees to buy a new one, but that's a large sum as cricket balls only cost 20 or 30 rupees. We know that Osama spent his days, when he wasn't watching TV, scribbling feverishly into a notebook and coming up with all kinds of monstrous plans. Destroy Zionist entity, uh, end American imperialism, uh, plan to kill President Obama, but not Joe Biden, it turns out, because he's not worth the trouble. <laughs> And since the news broke, we have more evidence. We have more intelligence that has been very carefully gathered. We know, thanks to Kesar, the very polite grocer, that Bin Laden's handlers bought only bulk food orders, uh, always major brands, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Nestle Milk, and that they only bought the good quality soaps and shampoos. And just in case you think I'm being funny here, I'm quoting from CNN and the Wall Street Journal. They always paid cash, never asked for credit, Kesar concluded breathlessly. Newspapers screamed blue murder. Apparently census takers had avoided the Bin Laden compound. Clearly the Pakistani population census organization was in on harboring the man. Or, or the 2011 census had only just started three weeks before. While Pakistan is at present pleading ignorance, <coughs> though the military has acknowledged in the, in the statement that they put out, that though there were intelligence shortcomings, it was the military's unparalleled cooperation that has resulted in more Al-Qaeda captures in Pakistan than in any other country, which seems like an incriminating thing to be boasting about. Um, the president has spoken of nothing, and the prime minister took two weeks uh, to come back from an international tour of France, uh, before which he told us that the failure wasn't only ours, but the entire world. So while all these factors uh, are at play, there are certain things we can know. There are certain things that we can be sure of. Things like the Hot Pursuit Agreement, uh, a deal signed between General Musharraf and General Stanley McChrystal, which says that America has the right to enter Pakistan at will, anytime it pleases, and engage in kill and or capture operations, while Pakistan reserves the right to deny that they had any knowledge of either of those things. And this is something we should probably be remembering as the days go by. If a nervous breakdown is a mental shutdown that stops its sufferers from coping with reality in any coherent way or with adapting to the world around them, then Pakistan and America are your poster children. But we handle our breakdowns in different ways, as Pakistanis via our romantic attachment to conspiracy theories and America through an enthusiastically frightening moral ambiguity. If President Obama's nine-minute celebratory speech announcing bin Laden's death reminded you of George W. Bush, but with better diction, <laughs> you are not alone. With no apparent sense of irony, President Obama eulogized those children who had lost loved ones due to terrorism and the scourge of violence, and those children whose parents' seats sat empty at the dinner table. But he said nothing of those orphaned children whose injustice was done to them by the man at the podium and by those that stood before him. Since Barack Obama took office, some 2,000 Pakistanis have been killed in drone strikes. And those are largely civilians. They are nameless, faceless Pakistanis. And no word was said about those losses or those children. President Obama spoke of bin Laden as being a mass murderer of Muslims but said nothing of the hundreds and thousands of Muslims who have been killed since the invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. Neither was there any acknowledgement that Iraq 
was a country that had nothing to do with Al Qaeda or with Osama bin Laden, but has only become fertile breeding ground for both parasites since American, British, French, and we should say Australian as well, troops put their boots on its soil. The death squad who killed bin Laden, we were told, exemplified courage and determination, so much so that they are now in hiding and their families fear for their lives. The murder, which was also simplified as today's achievement, was a testament to the greatness of America and to the determination of the American people, who we were told, in the manner of a pep talk given to slightly obtuse children, can accomplish anything that they set their minds to, whether that is standing up for equality or defending their values abroad or pursuing property. But he didn't mention the failures of this can-do country, the renditions the disappearances of suspects who were not even told what it was that they were suspected of, the torture, the waterboarding, the schools and wedding parties accidentally hit by smart bombs and predator drones. And in perhaps the grossest pronouncement of triumphalism, we were told that we were either with President Obama in celebratory euphoria or not, and that all those who valued peace and human dignity would welcome the demise of Osama bin Laden. Unfortunately, this moral turpitude was not unique to America's president, and if one needed coaching in just exactly how to enjoy assassination, you had plenty of options to choose from. Muslim groups across America and the world lined up to, to rejoice and separate themselves from Osama bin Laden. Eli Wiesel called it a death deserved and defended the cheering hordes of people whose delight was somehow more excusable than it would have been had the shoe been on the other foot. And the Dalai Lama, even the Dalai Lama, in the same breath in which he told us that he was so compassionate, he avoided swatting mosquitoes whenever possible. Opined in his maroon Buddhist robes that when it was necessary to take countermeasures, then one ought to take countermeasures. This ethical degradation is not American, but it's to do with power, and specifically a power on the decline. Paranoid, empty of glory, and threatened by everyone, even its shadows. But they're not the only guilty ones here. Pakistan, now for Pakistan. When it comes to conspiracy theories, we are the Shahrazad of nations. So dependent on we are so dependent we are on storytelling for our survival. According to a recent Pakistani newspaper poll, 66% of us don't actually believe that Osama bin Laden was killed in our country. Um, and should we? Maybe not. Um, Osama bin Laden was armed when the SEALs came in to kill him. Osama bin Laden was unarmed when the SEALs came to kill him. One of his guards was armed, none of his guards was armed. He hid behind his 27-year-old Yemeni wife. He didn't hide behind his 27-year-old Yemeni wife. He lived in a multi-million dollar mansion. It wasn't a multi-million dollar mansion. It was a middle class house. It had 18 foot high boundary walls. Every house in Pakistan has 18 foot high boundary walls. He was shot in the head. He was shot in the eye. He was buried at sea. We can't tell you which sea, but anyone on the Arabian coast shouldn't go near seafood for a while. <laughs> We're 99.9% .9 sure that the man we shot in Abbottabad and buried at sea was Osama bin Laden, American officials told the BBC. Foreign news anchors spent precious airtime um, devoted to the fact that the bin Laden compound did not have its garbage picked up, but had it burnt instead. They burnt their garbage, tight-necked presenters. That was my American accent, just in case you couldn't tell. Um, declared portentously. Um, except that there are no garbage collectors in South Asia. So if we do anything at all with garbage, that's what we do, we burn it. We're showing the pictures, we're not showing the pictures. We don't trot this stuff out as trophies, said President Obama. Not that it stopped them from showing us Uday and Hussein Hussein's dead bodies, Saddam Hussein being pulled out of a rat hole, or in fact, Saddam Hussein's hanging. And maybe... Maybe it's not our fault. It's not difficult to conspiracy theorize Osama bin Laden. He was made of the stuff. He had renal failure, but there were no dialysis machines at the compound. He hid in Kashmir. He led Chechen groups. He was an Arsenal fan. 
Um, all bunk, it turns out. Don DeLillo wrote that a conspiracy is everything that ordinary life is not. It's the inside game, cold, sure, undistracted, and forever closed off to us. We are the flawed ones, the innocents, trying to make some rough sense of that daily jostle. Conspirators have a logic and a daring beyond our reach, and all conspiracies are the same taught story of men who find coherence in some criminal act. And we do this to an art form in Pakistan. So easy is it to take refuge in the shadowy world of maybes and maybe not, uh, to blame all our failings on bogeymen, on the CIA, on Mossad, on anyone except ourselves. It saves us the trouble of confronting reality. It saves us the trouble of having to take the responsibility of abusing our country, the promise of our country, so quickly and so shamelessly. It saves us having to take the responsibility of assassinating the potential of our very young Pakistan in the span of one short lifetime. And it saves us from demanding better of our feckless rulers and depriving them of their overwhelming power over us when they have failed us, which they do all the time. It took America five days after killing Osama um, to launch a drone strike against Pakistan. Five days and 15 or so. Dead later, what did we do in Pakistan? Nothing. We didn't talk about the 15 dead, the 15 dead who are, as always, nameless, faceless people. We chose instead to talk endlessly about whether one man really died or didn't die. But perhaps out of all the theories I've heard, the best one is in-house. The Arab Springs negated the need for Osama bin Laden. Something new is happening across the Middle East and it has nothing to do with Al-Qaeda <laughs> or with this towering zombie that has been manufactured for us as the source of all evil and all injustice. But rather, the cause of and, and the catalyst for those Arab Springs are real reasons. They are the crown princes of oil-rich states that the West and the world have supported for decades and dictators of bygone eras. The discourse, I think, with the Arab Springs has shifted. Now that Osama bin Laden is dead, the conflict between America and its wars and those who resist them is raw. And nobody gets to hide behind Osama anymore. Not America, not the terrorists. He's outrun his purpose. And while he outran his purpose, resistance across Asia has increased and it blossomed and it evolved and it progressed. Osama bin Laden has no relevance in the Middle East today and he certainly has no relevance in Asia. And anyone who thinks that they can derail the process that has started by trying somehow to reinsert him into our imagination and anyone who thinks that the narrative now between people and power can be shifted by Osama even after his death, doesn't realize that after the spring, there will be summers and autumns and winters to follow. Thank you. states that induces nervous breakdowns and we know that nation states at the moment are facing attacks on multiple fronts from multinationals which seek to replace the power of the state from fluid immigration and how it is that we begin to think of our citizens and what makes them citizens and from hyper increased connectivity which means god help us that facebook has a population 20 times the size of australia but this is about pakistan um, at least that's what people keep telling me, a country that is perpetually on the verge of nervously breaking down. It is the world's sixth most populous country.
Assalamu alaikum. Oh, <laughs> you're supposed to say it back. <laughs> it's how we say hello. <laughs> Wa alaikum assalam. Um, it's an honor to be here with you today opening the 2011 Sydney Writers' Festival, though perhaps a more dubious privilege to be called upon to speak about nervous breakdowns. I just say that it, it seems fitting that the head of the IMF would turn out to be a rapist. Um, <laughs> uh, France, they've just taken a bigotry dynastic with Marine Le Pen, replacing her father as the head of the French National Front. They've passed laws mandating what women can and cannot wear, which is very Saudi Arabia of them. And they have a president who takes counsel from Bernard-Henri Lévy, which alone should qualify them for some kind of emeritus nervous breakdown award. <laughs> Maybe it's the very concept of, of nation, the world's fifth largest nuclear state, and has, depending on who you ask, the seventh or the fifth largest army in the world. Barack Obama has publicly called us a cancer. Um, Madeleine Albright is slightly more polite. To her, we're just an international migraine. And Hillary Clinton, who knows something about the subject, frequently begins most of her thoughts on Pakistan with, it's not an easy relationship, but. Um, <laughs> And Salman Rushdie at the moment is very cross and wants us declared, all 180 million of us, a terrorist state for something that really most of us at least didn't know. Um, which seemed to be the natural order of the day, it's almost a universal condition. Who isn't having a nervous breakdown right about now? And it's, it's certainly not just Pakistan. Um, Libya. Uh, the country has just become the West's fourth battleground after Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Muammar Gaddafi has just become a soldier again after some downtime buying shares in football teams and financial newspapers. And the West is arming the rebels to the teeth uh, without particularly bothering to ask who in fact the rebels are. France, and 